السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته To carry on with the special embryology lectures I'm gonna cover in this presentation the development of the gut tube and the development of the esophagus I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh Professor and Head of Anatomy Department at Mansoura University, Egypt To understand the development of the gastrointestinal tract, we need to go back to the third week of development where the embryo was formed of a trilaminal germ layer. Then in the fourth week of development, there is folding of the embryo both in lateral direction and in cephalocodal direction. Thus, the primitive gut tube would be formed and it is formed of the following parts, the pharynx the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. We should know that the epithelial lining of the gastrointestinal tract and the associated glands are derived from the endoderm, while the muscle coat of the gastrointestinal tract and its peritoneal covering are derived from the splanchnic layer of mesoderm. Let's go back to the third week of development. This is the endometrial layer and this is the gestational sac. You can see the amniotic cavity, the yolk sac cavity and in between them lies the trilaminal germ disc. If we enlarge it, you can notice the three germ layers, the ectodermal layer, the mesodermal layer and the endodermal layer. Notice that the mesodermal layer splits into two layers. The one that will cover the amniotic cavity is called somatopleuric layer and the one that covers the yolk sac cavity is called splanchnopleuric layer. During the fourth week of development, because of the growth of the embryo in two directions, the trilaminar germ layers now will fold the bone itself and, and part of the endometrium will be trapped inside the cylindrical embryo now. So, in this picture, you can see the somites that grows on each side of the notochord or the axis of the embryo will cause the embryo to fold upon itself in a lateral direction and become cylindrical in shape. Thus, part of the yolk sac will be trapped inside the body cavity. Also, another factor that will affect the growth of the embryo is the formation of the neural tube and because of the growth of the brain in this direction and formation of the head fold and also formation of the tail fold the embryo will now bend in a cephalocodal direction so part of the yolk sac will be trapped inside the tail fold forming the hind gut and also inside the cephalic fold or head fold forming the foregut in this sagittal section of the embryo, now we can see the gut tube here, which is colored in yellow. The gut tube is formed from the 4th to the 8th weeks of development. It extends from the pacopharyngeal membrane cranially till the cloacal membrane caudally. And it is divided into the following areas. The pharynx the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on the development of the foregut and its derivatives. In the same time, the heart is formed, and its big vessel here, which is called the aorta, is formed as well. And the three branches come out of the dorsal aorta to supply the gut tube. The foregut will be supplied by a branch called the celiac trunk. Later on, it will be divided into three branches, the left gastric, the hepatic, and the splenic. The midgut will be supplied by a single branch called superior mesenteric artery. And the hindgut will be supplied by another single branch which is called the inferior mesenteric artery. 
The foregut will give rise to the following derivatives, the esophagus, the stomach, the upper half of the duodenum, the liver, the gallbladder, the bile duct, and the pancreas. Also, a diverticulum arises from the foregut. It's called the respiratory diverticulum, which will give a rise to the respiratory system. And you can check the development of the respiratory system in a previous video. Now let's talk about the development of the esophagus. During the fourth week of development, the respiratory diverticulum appears in the ventral wall of the primitive foregut. In this side view, you can see the foregut lies dorsally and the respiratory diverticulum lies ventral to it. At first, they communicate with each other. And if we rotate it to see it from the ventral aspect, then two folds of mesoderm called the tracheoesophageal septa will arise and approximate to each other and separate the foregut from the respiratory diverticulum. The primitive foregut then will be divided into the tracheobronchial tube ventrally and the esophagus dorsally. Initially, the esophagus is short but elongates with the descent of the heart and lungs downward. During the development of the esophagus and the rest of the gut tube, the endodermal lining will proliferate and obliterate the lumen. But later on, small cavities appear and the recanalization or reopening takes place one more time. Restoring its lumen. Regarding the esophageal anomalies, we can have either anomalies during the formation of the esophagotracheal septum, leading to esophageal atresia or esophagotracheal fistulae. Also, if there is abnormality during the elongation of the esophagus, we could end up with a short esophagus. Or we could have anomalies regarding the process of recanalization of the esophagus, so we end up with either esophageal atresia or stenosis. Finally, we could have abnormalities regarding innervation of one segment of the esophagus leading to uh, what is called mega esophagus. So back to the formation of the tracheoesophageal septum again. If there is deviation of this septum backwards, we could end up with this kind of anomaly which is called esophageal atresia, where the esophagus is made of two parts, either separate from each other like this or connected just by fibrous tissue. The upper part of the esophagus ends blindly. It ends like a blind pouch while the lower part of the esophagus opens by a fistula into the back of the trachea. The abnormality in the descent or the elongation of the esophagus, like I said, it will give us what's called short esophagus. And because the esophagus is short, so it will pull the cardiac end of the stomach through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm into the thorax. And in this case, we call this anomaly hiatus hernia. Another type of anomalies of the esophagus regarding its canalization. If there is partial failure of canalization, we will have what's called esophageal stenosis, means narrowing of the lumen of the esophagus, as we can see in this picture. But if there is no recanalization at one part of the esophagus or if it is severe, we will end up with esophageal atresia. Again, the esophagus here ends as two blind pouches connected with each other by either fibrous cord or they may open into the trachea by fistula. Finally, if we have 
abnormality or anomalies in innervation of the esophagus. Like I said, this anomaly is called the mega esophagus. And this happens because that uh, this segment of the esophagus is not uh, innervated or there is lack of formation of the autonomic ganglia of the segments of the esophagus. So there will be no prestalytic movement here. And this will affect the segment above it and it will become very dilated. Thus the name mega esophagus. Uh, this would be the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. And if you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like, and share.